Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining the second webinar in our Every Penny Count series. Today's topic of discussion is one that's really high on most charities and indeed most organizations' agenda, and that's challenging and optimizing your cost base. A few housekeeping bits before we get started. So you'll notice everyone is off camera and on mute. If we could keep that the case uh, whilst the speakers are talking, that would be great. And there's a, a comment function um, that's live, so please do engage with that throughout the session. Um, and we'll have some Q&A time towards the end of the webinar to answer any questions. So we've got a packed agenda today, and I'm delighted to be presenting uh, along with a couple of my colleagues, Gavin and Glynn, who will introduce themselves as we move along the topics. I'm Ross McQuirr. Um, I'm a director in our value creation services team, and we focus on cost optimization and operational and performance improvement, working with a lot of charities to protect their bottom line, but also to improve their value for money and effectiveness in raising income too. I'll be walking us through uh, the first three agenda items um, this morning. First, I'll give a short update on the sector's current performance. Then I'll talk a little bit about what a cost-based review and optimization initiative might look like before sharing a case study um, of a charity we've recently supported that will help hopefully bring it all to life with some practical tools and guidance. We then have a spotlight from Gavin Russell uh, of Predict for Mobile who will be delving into a specific tool that can help you manage um, some of your telecommunications costs before Glyn Woodhouse um, will take us through some pertinent tax considerations. So without further ado, I'll move us on to the sector snapshot. So what I wanted to do here was just set the scene a little bit um, and highlight why today's discussion topics are so relevant. So we're discussing cost pressures with a lot of charity leadership teams and trustees at the moment. And there's a lot going on in the sector that's fueling this. So inflation is still very high. Um, the rate of inflation seems to be slowing slightly, um, but that doesn't mean the prices have stopped rising. It just kind of means that they're now rising slightly more slowly than they were doing. That's come at a time when supply chain difficulties were already creating cost pressures and recruitment challenges uh, and low unemployment were increasing wage demands. And vacancies um, have been and are uh, at record highs in the sector, which is creating cost pressures as well. These more recent developments um, have then been combined with reduced donations, cuts in public funding, um, pressures on income levels, and all against a uh, kind of backdrop of increased need um, so clearly a really challenging environment at the moment. Um, but are we seeing uh, these kind of issues manifest themselves in the sector's financials? So in short, unfortunately, yes. What I'm showing on screen uh, at the moment is some analysis we've run on the level of deficit charities are running in their most recent financial statements. The chart splits charities um, by size and considers whether they're in deficit and what the size of the deficit is. What we can clearly see um, is that pressures, uh, and the pressures I've just been talking about, clearly manifesting themselves in charities showing a little bit of uh, financial instability. The data is pulled directly from the Charity Commission um, and shows around half of charities are in a deficit position. But splitting that down further, what we can see um, is that a significant minority of those charities that are in deficit uh, have what we've labelled as kind of a, an unsustainable deficit, which is expenditure of around, you know, kind of 120% of income or more. And the reason that's so important is because, you know, without wanting to kind of state the obvious, um, the level of deficit an organisation is facing informs the way in which they, they need to respond. And organisations with larger deficits in the absence of reserves are more likely to need um, to challenge their cost base from a bit more of a strategic lens and perspective rather than a tactical perspective. Looking at the graph again, there's also quite a lot um, of clear correlation we can see between the size of the organisation and the deficit that's being faced. So looking primarily at the red and orange segments of the chart, 
smaller charities with income under 50 million um, are much more likely to be facing cost challenges. This kind of coupled with the fact um, that they're also likely to have significant reserves shows that the, the size of the issue um, is pretty large. This next slide um, then shows the same data, uh, but this time cut by subsector. So different sectors are naturally going to face different pressures, but the sector that you're in will also inform um, the nature of your cost base and the way in which you approach a cost optimization exercise. So in terms of the data, what, what we're seeing um, is an interesting trend that COVID lockdown may have encouraged the popularity of organizations focused on nature, fitness and animals, which could be resulting in a, a slight relaxation um, of the deficit pressures those types of organizations are facing. But what we're also seeing is that COVID may have resulted um, in increased pressure for some subsectors, particularly arts and culture um, in this chart. But enough of the doom and gloom on this, looking out my window, lovely Wednesday morning. What can be done about it um, and how can organisations effectively respond uh, and challenge their cost base? So at BDO, we typically uh, follow a five-stage approach to challenging the cost base of an organisation. These stages uh, can sometimes be fluid and it's not uncommon for them to overlap. What's on screen here um, is each of those stages and taking them in turn, I'll give a bit of an overview uh, on what stage, uh, what each stage entails um, and where the key focus is. So first is the, the definition of what we call an operational and financial baseline. This is information that, that most organizations usually think they have readily available, but what we often find is that it's, it's slightly more difficult uh, and time consuming to produce than it, than it probably should be. So the financial baseline is typically um, an annual budget by function or department, um, but importantly that this is split out into people related costs and third party costs. This becomes really important uh, when you're analysing uh, the cost and value drivers because naturally both elements are very different. And then the operational baseline is a listing uh, which contains an organisation role by department which ideally also includes spans and layers of that department. Uh, so for example, how many management uh, people, how many team leaders, and how many transaction level heads there are. So these two schedules should really reconcile, um, and they're pretty much the starting point of all of the analysis uh, that we tend to undertake. And that's why on these kind of webinars, I really ask participants to really challenge themselves on whether they have these two baselines um, or if they don't already have them to hand, could they compile them uh, in less than a few days for the purposes uh, of this exercise? And what it also does is the financial and operational baselines really help organisations to understand um, and assess all of the cost areas. But what it also does is um, kind of create a baseline from which um, the organisation can benchmark and quantify future benefits. So now you've got a really robust starting point um, upon which to base the analysis. Stage two is then to hold uh, a stakeholder workshop or depending on the size of the charity, a series of workshops to overlay any qualitative information relevant, relevant to this exercise. The intention of this workshop um, is to get everyone bought into the baseline as an agreed starting point and also to begin to get an understanding um, of where the areas of focus might be. So what we tend to find, um, depending on the levels of financial reporting at an organisation, is ownership and challenge of the budget and cost base is only really done by the finance function. And whilst that's um, perfectly understandable, experience tells us that, that getting cost owners involved in the discussion early can often be a lot more effective. Stage three um, is then the benchmarking and hypothesis development stage. So our team generally adopts a hypothesis-based approach to nearly all of these assignments. And that's because it, it really helps define an early stage, uh, the potential opportunities um, and a straw man to take aim at. So it can be quite easy to focus on trying to gather too much granular data early on before taking a kind of higher level view of where the opportunity might lie. 
defining a set of hypotheses first um, and socializing them between the leadership team can often create a more focused exercise. Um, and to support this exercise, benchmarking can be a really useful tool. So considering how your performance compares uh, to that of your peers can really help towards um, pointing out where there might be areas of overspend um, or support a conversation with a budget holder by pointing to some uh, kind of external evidence. Generally, we'll find, and it's kind of very circumstantial, um, that we'll try and develop 10 to 15 hypotheses um, of where an opportunity to optimize the cost base might be, and then we'll go on to test those. An example of our hypothesis and not wanting at all to kind of shamelessly set up Gavin's part later might be that we identify our telecommunications cost uh, and spend is high. Our employees aren't really using their mobile phones as much as we might think and is questioning whether, you know, all our employees actually need mobile phones for the role that they're fulfilling. We might want to look into this a bit further um, and the fact that our telecommunications costs relative to our size and organization complexity might appear high is a hypothesis that we'll investigate. Stage four, um, so now we've got kind of a list of 10 to 15 areas we want to look at in a bit more detail. The next stage is to do some deeper analysis and identify the specific opportunities for us to optimize our cost base. Typical activities here might be um, analysis of granular transaction level information, um, a, a deep dive into specific activities and roles of selected functions, or assessing specific uh, business processes, systems, people's activities, that kind of thing. Um, or it might be a, a deep dive into various third party spend categories uh, and procurement channels. But the level of activity and the specific tasks here at this stage um, are really very dependent upon the, the hypotheses that are set um, and which are eventually going to be tested. And I think generally the aim here um, is out of hypotheses and confirming which hypotheses there are. Um, experience tells us that from kind of 15 hypotheses, you'll generally find um, that there are five to 10 opportunities to take cost out. That then leads us on to our kind of last stage um, which is opportunity uh, validation and obtaining stakeholder buy. -in. So by this point, we'll have a list of five to 10 to 15 initiatives um, that can be completed to reduce your cost base. Socializing these with the necessary stakeholders and gaining buy-in um, then becomes fairly critical. So for an effective cost-saving exercise to be embedded, um, getting hold of the, the kind of hearts and minds piece is really important. Um, and the easiest way of doing that is to, to kind of have regular touch points with all key stakeholders and build a really collaborative plan of action. From here, the exercise then kind of transitions into a more change management program um, where as an organization, you'll need to plan and execute these initiatives. Um, we're not covering those in massive amounts of details um, as part of this webinar but I'll touch on some of the elements um, at a high level later. So if that was the process um, that we go through, what are some practical areas um, that you could be considering? So on screen, what we've got here is uh, kind of the five Ps that we label, label them. So the five Ps are areas that can be looked at um, and they provide a bit of a baseline um, when developing possible cost reduction hypotheses. So to go into them in uh, a bit more detail, uh, the first is people. So is your structure designed in the most optimal way to deliver your services? Could you consolidate functions? Does the workload justify the number of heads required? Could activities be outsourced uh, for reduced costs like payroll and pension management? But practically, if you're looking at your staffing budget, you might be able to reduce your spends um, against that budget by carrying some staff vacancies, either willingly or unwillingly at the moment. Um, you might not be able to fill um, the post at present, which will of course reduce your uh, kind of short-term spending on staffing. But another way um, of thinking about it a bit more strategically might be thinking about whether you have the right people doing the jobs that you need, or do you need to think about you know, slightly redesigning your structure or operating model? 
process and systems. So are the right people doing the right thing on the right system? Are processes standardized to ensure that they're optimized? Um, or are some processes legacy processes that may not be required at all? Place um, is then premises, property, um, and the buildings that you use to deliver your service. Can your services um, be used in a way um, that means you, you may not longer uh, need expensive upkeep um, of a building, or could you move to smaller premises? Procurement, um, have you appropriately challenged all of your third party cost lines? Are you getting uh, the maximum amount of economies of scale? Um, could you consolidate areas of spend with a single supplier potentially? Do you regularly retender? Um, and do you have kind of tight controls over your discretionary costs? All of those tend to be really good levers to look at first. Um, this third party procurement tends to be an area where there's quite a lot of benefit to go after. Priorities. Um, so fundamentally, are you spending your money on the right priorities? Um, could you reprioritize or rescope your aims and deliver slightly less, um, but with more impact? So if you currently offer a service that costs a lot of money to deliver, um, could you reduce the number of people uh, you can support or reduce the hours that the service is open? That's quite a tactical way of looking at it, but maybe you can think about it more strategically um, and think about the way in which you shape that priority. So can you deliver in a different way um, or can you use a different method, method of meeting those beneficiary needs? Now, that's not an exhaustive list, um, but typically um, the, what we tend to find is looking at the whole cost base through these lenses um, enriches the discussion and widens the scope. Uh, of the exercise. But having done um, kind of what feels like a hundred, potentially thousands of these, what I just wanted to do is speak to um, some high level trends that we're seeing um, and discussing with trustees. So the top left is right sizing your aims, objectives, um, and operations. So a key area of assessment we've seen um, is organizations really challenging the objectives they're trying to achieve um, and what implication that has on their operations and cost base. What we often see um, is that charities have grown over a kind of an extended period of time and that it's not uncommon um, for their operating models to have been developed with slightly less structure um, than other sectors as they've potentially added services or merged operations. This can sometimes create, uh, you know, an operating model that hasn't been challenged for a number of years and as such possibly isn't as effective or efficient as it could be. The first step um, in really considering whether this applies is kind of taking a step back and assessing the what question of what your organization is trying to achieve. What this typically does is raise a few questions uh, on whether there's been significant scope creep um, as a charity has grown, that's caused it to, to expand activities potentially beyond core competencies and capabilities. If that's the case, it's probably likely um, that a significant amount of cost has been added, um, but this may not be converting or translating into incremental value. The second is challenging uh, what's happening and where it's happening. So COVID has, um, without wanting to kind of bring up bad memories of COVID, and as we've all been talking about um, for what seems to be forever, in a very short space of time, change the way we work, uh, where we work, and how we interact with one another. What this does is, is clearly create um, and produce a new way of working and operating that every organization is considering as they rethink how they redefine their operating model post-COVID. With this, though, becomes a major opportunity. How can organizations use COVID um, and the recent challenging times as a platform to develop a different operating model, occupancy strategy, or way of working? The two um, final ones, uh, three and four, are then somewhat interrelated. Um, so the third, manage costs but focus on value. Naturally, um, as income has dropped over the last kind of 12 to 24 months for most organizations, 
leadership teams have been increasingly focusing on their cost base. Um, when managing cost, though, there's a tendency to place a slight emphasis on um, indirect costs versus direct costs. Whilst this is incredibly important, analysis on where costs are truly adding value is also critical. So as funding falls um, and becomes slightly less predictable, it's really valuable to assess your cost base against what's really driving value, what cost levers can be pulled and ultimately how this is affecting frontline services. Crucially here, though, um, metrics which capture return on funds invested um, to drive performance are really essential. The last one um, is then being measured but bold. So that's a bit management speaking. Um, but I think really what I'm trying to get across is that in our experience, it's common to find that, that many charities have spent a number of years responding to funding deficits by reducing costs and possibly salami slicing to kind of calibrate their models to budget deficits. More recently, though, um, the challenging environment has led to kind of a, a greater need um, for organisations to make longer lasting recalibrations and be addressing issues of source. So while there's enormous difficulties being faced by almost everyone, it's also provided an opportunity um, for charities in all sectors really to make bolder decisions um, and make slightly more strategic um, material changes through more fundamental reviews of their target operating models. And whilst this can take um, slightly longer and potentially be more disruptive, the benefits uh, to long-term resilience can, can tend to be more substantial. So lastly, what I want to do is just talk uh, a little bit about a recent project um, that our team's been involved with and how we approached it and some brief lessons learned. So this particular project was supporting a large UK-based charity to address a significant funding deficit they were facing. The exam question here wasn't really a simple cost-cutting exercise. It was more of one um, of redefining the way in which the charity's back office operated. This was mainly due to a belief that the leadership team and trustees had um, that their central cost structure was possibly not as efficient um, as it could be, uh, and that there existed a number of opportunities to reduce costs, but crucially, without impacting delivery of services. So on this particular project, um, from a central cost base of around 20 million, we identified two to four million pounds worth of cost saving initiatives um, that could be implemented over a, a kind of 18 month time frame. Two critical elements um, stood out here, which I just want to go into a bit of detail too though. The first um, was the importance of the financial and operational baseline. What this did was really provide kind of a version of the truth um, that everyone agreed with and allowed decisions to be made on a consistent and factual um, information base. A lot of these exercises are naturally very data driven to so making sure that there's a really robust starting point and that everyone is brought into that as a starting point is incredibly important. The second was then the hypothesis development stage. So we leaned at this stage quite heavily on the benchmarking data that we could get um, to inform where the opportunities might lie. In this particular case, HR, finance and payroll costs were quite a bit higher than the charity's peer group. Analyzing that further um, showed that the, the kind of operating model of the care charity relied on a number of local site staff uh, that were following unstandardized processes rather effectively. Moving these to a shared service center uh, operation and embedding a kind of set way of working improved efficiency levels um, whilst also creating cost reductions. I've then got uh, kind of three lessons learned upon screen, um, which I'll just talk a little bit about as well. So the first is setting up um, a robust program management office to manage and track change. Generally, what we tend to find um, is that organizations that are smaller, possibly haven't undertaken a major transformation program before. The, temp the temptation is, sorry, um, to run these as uh, kind of a lot of individual smaller projects rather than a fully joined up program um, that approaches the cost optimization program wholly. What this tends to do is create subgroups where interdependencies can't be tracked. Uh, everyone isn't informed on progress. Um, and then it naturally becomes quite difficult 
um, for the left hand to be moving with the right. It's then kind of developing plans collaboratively and where possible with employees. I won't touch too much on that just in the interest of time. But the third one is then acting on quick wins and celebrating successes. So naturally, the change projects um, prioritize um, the cost initiatives uh, that have maximum potential benefit and are easier to implement. And what that does um, and characterizing these as quick wins and doing them first helps build confidence um, in the program to get buy-in, um, to make sure that everyone's going through the journey um, kind of as encouraged as possible. So at that point, I think I've been talking for far too long and what I'd love to do is hand over um, to Gavin Russell from Predict for Mobile, who will give us a spotlight on optimizing your telecommunications costs. Thank you very much, Ross. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for your interest this morning. Uh, hopefully, you're going to find what I present of practical value, uh, and we look forward to the opportunity of supporting you. First slide, please, Ross. Hopefully, we all agree with this statement. We also probably agree there are a number of common challenges that you all face. Core funding being at the top of the pile, but digital inclusion and equality are fast becoming important to deliver your services, whether that's through your service users, staff teams, or volunteer networks. Next slide, thanks, Ross. We recognize four key factors that have a huge impact on the capacity of a charity, a community group, or other not-for-profit organization to deliver the critical services in their area of focus. The level of success that can be achieved is determined by the relevant dependency. For example, on the first row there, in order to pay less and get more means that you need to be able to precisely identify your requirements. However, in markets like business mobile communications, it's extremely hard to manage these dependencies. When the procurement process is frustratingly obscured, it's extremely hard and there's almost no access to impartial subject matter expertise. In most instances, you expend more time and resource than you can afford, and you end up with a contract with higher direct costs than you need to be spending. Plus, there's additional unnecessary indirect costs because it doesn't fit with your true needs. In the worst case scenario, this can even impact the availability or access to the digital tools vital to support your service users in creating a positive impact. Next slide, thanks. So who are we? What's Predict for Mobile? Um, the good news is for everybody on this webinar, our uh, process and our services are completely free of charge. Um, we operate as a comparison platform to radically simplify the business mobile communications procurement. We make the process of writing a tender, finding suitable suppliers, and choosing a final proposal straightforward and easy. The platform provides a highly competitive environment for a select panel of the UK's best suppliers that we've personally vetted to ensure a higher standard of quality of service and value than any recognized framework agreement. Suppliers submit tailored proposals to your bespoke tender on a best and final basis only. These proposals are subjected to expert and impartial benchmarking and are presented to you in a clear and intuitive side-by-side -side comparison, empowering you with better informed decision-making capability and so that you can choose the best solution perfectly tailored to your needs. But what's the outcome of all these lovely marketing words? Save money? Yep. Our average is over 50% on current versus current contract costs. Save time? Typically, we reduce the procurement process by over eight weeks. And furthermore, we enable greater control of the outcome. Uh, it's your decision that drives the whole process from start to finish. But what this really means is that you've got market experts in your corner working in your best interests. If you can go to the next one, thanks, Ross. 
What follows are a few slides to illustrate the actual live platform process itself. The first step is that we can quickly identify 95% of the core facts needed to determine your true needs by analyzing commonly available billing reports. The output from this analysis, plus your answers to a few key questions about your preferences, allows us to very rapidly and automatically generate a bespoke tender for you in just a matter of minutes. Step two is that you sit back as we publish your tender to our supplier super panel and secure response proposals from them. And typically we, we allow a window of about two weeks uh, for that process to step place, take place. Next, thanks Ross. Step three, as you can see on the screen, the supplier's proposals are shown in a familiar and clear way, very similar to what you see in the consumer space. But the big difference here, as you'll see across the top, is that whilst price is the all important thing in consumer uh, uh, world, clearly in the business to business world, there's other factors that we need to look at and you can filter the view according to those. Our overall benchmarking will take price and, or value as we represent it um, as the biggest single consideration, but we can delve into our other areas so that you can filter and, and get it to the stage that, that you can choose based on what looks best for you. Next, thanks. What, what offers even more opportunity for uh, more informed decision making is the ability to be able to put this side by side um, and truly delve in in a true apples to apples uh, comparison basis, uh, consistently looking at all the responses across all the, the, the uh, supply proposals that we get on the same basis so that you can be assured that uh, it's a completely impartial and independent view that you're looking through, but at a very high level of detail and something that is easy to comprehend. And plus there's the ability to share this output with internal colleagues if there are other decision-making authorities that you need to take your preferences to. Next one, thanks. Finally, our, our Sensible Intelligence Portal provides easy to use and understandable reporting and analysis of your cost and usage to coincide with your billing every month. This is something that we can implement prior to running a tender so that you can truly get a, a very detailed and in-depth feel for how your organization is currently using Business Mobile. Plus it's something that's available after the tender process so that you can ensure that your cost and your usage are within the parameters of the contract and that you're not experiencing any unexpected cost. In that way, you can make sure that your usage is always optimized. And plus at the end of the, the next contract period, you have everything to hand to be able to run your next tender through the platform. Next, thanks, Ross. Just to finish up, I thought it'd be a good idea to give you an insight into some of our experience in the not-for-profit place. Um, one of the charities that we work with, the Prince's Trust, had over a thousand business mobile lines that, they, that needed renewing. The tariff that they had was a good tariff, um, but the non-transparent additions that were involved in the contract were causing them significant pain. We also identified a number of lines that were never being used and could be removed to achieve greater operational efficiency. The outcome, needless to say, they were very happy and both they and their chosen supplier are now enjoying using Sensible Intelligence Portal to make sure that the positive impact we achieve together is sustained throughout the duration of the contract. We've got many other examples of charities uh, that promote digital inclusion, include World Wildlife Fund for Nature, MenCap, and more local charities such as Inclusion Go uh, Glasgow and Leeds Autism. Uh, so we, we really enjoy working in this space and, and making a difference. And again, we look forward to having the opportunity of working with some of you and supporting you 
uh, in, in making this cost efficiency uh, in this important area. I'd now like to forward on to Glenn, who's going to be able to talk to you about some tax related. Thanks. Thanks, Gavin. Um, really, really interesting. I found that. Um, so a very warm welcome from me. My name is Glenn Woodhouse. And those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the head of indirect tax not for profit for BDO nationally. Um, and indeed, the, the, the regional um, VAT lead as well in the south. So um, I haven't got very long, so we're going to dive straight in. And if uh, Ross, we can go into my first slide. Thank you. Um, so tax considerations when we're looking at cost reduction. Obviously, tax is, is a cost for, for most businesses. If corporation taxes aren't, then certainly indirect tax and VAT will be. Um, there are two ways of looking at this particular lens. The first le lens I would look through is what available reliefs have you got? Are you maximizing them? And we'll talk a little bit about some of those and some of the challenges there. Um, but I would also encourage you to think about cost more widely um, because the cost of getting things wrong in the tax space uh, can be extreme. So even if you have a challenge from the revenue that you can't readily deal with, um, it's likely that um, even, even, if you, even if you win your challenge with the revenue and the revenue go away, you will have burned through enormous amounts of uh, management time. You'll have burned through lots and lots of staff time, and you may have also burned through some consulting costs as well. What I would encourage everybody on this call to do is to, is to um, really delve down into those uh, reliefs and make sure that they do apply, make sure that you have the evidence for them applying, um, and that way, such things can be can be dealt with very, very quickly. So what are we talking about? Well, first off, um, to touch on a, a rather unfamiliar subject for me um, is corporation taxes. Um, it's important to remember that corporation tax exemptions don't automatically apply to everything that a charity does. Um, a charity involved in, in anything which is deemed trading, for example, um, has, a, has a very, very small exemption and then uh, will start to get the application of corporation taxes. Um, so it's really, really important that you, you manage that. Looking on the income side, on the VAT side, um, business, non-business, um, this is a, a really, really hot topic at the minute. Um, the revenue have basically torn up all of their previous guidance on business, non-business, and then focused on two recent case law judgments um, of Longridge and Thames and, and Wakefield and uh, distilled the tests there. Frankly, those tests are very, very wide um, and not massively helpful. Um, so when you, when, when you take a look at them, um, I'm not entirely sure I understand exactly what, uh, exactly where the, where the barrier is. There is no definition of, of business for VAT and that is inevitably leaving an opaque line. Um, where that becomes particularly difficult is where you have um, partnership working, um, I think I've got it further down the slide and, and grants versus supplies where you're, where you're working in partnership and you're looking to um, broaden out your, your income base. Um, great care needs to be, be, be applied there um, to make sure that you are, you are actually doing the right thing. Um, fundraising and the, the exemption specifically for fundraising um, appears to be uh, slightly broader than it was before. Um, many of you will have seen the commentary around um, the, the, the uh, Yorkshire show. Um, and the requirements in order to be within the fundraising exemption for um, publicizing the, 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 the event is for fundraising purposes. Um, it seems that that may not be the case, although I have heard that um, Yorkshire Show is um, under appeal. If you are claiming the exemption for fundraising and fundraising events particularly, um, I, would, um, I would urge you to, to, to look at the, the applicable rules and see if you can get comfortably within those rules. If you have not applied the, the fundraising exemption because you were unable to have great statements as to um, the fact that it was for fundraising, for example, it's worth taking a look at and seeing whether the, the Yorkshire case, show case is worth, um, worth you putting a claim in um, anyway. Um, when we're looking at income as well, don't forget that the revenue always see uh, use of trademarks and logos as being subject to VAT. So even on, e e even on corporate participation agreements where you have agreements with people who are going to raise money for your organization, I'd be a little bit careful that uh, 
you do value those trademarks and logos um, and actually charge VAT accordingly. On the other side of the, the coin is VAT on your costs. Um, there are a whole range of VAT reliefs on costs um, and it's really, really important that you claim them. Many providers to charities um, habitually will charge um, VAT on their services, A, because that's what they're used to doing, and B, because there is no risk to them for doing that. Um, you do need to challenge that with them, um, but with care. Um, in some cases, particularly for the, the bigger reliefs, so if we look at the reliefs um, very, very quickly, uh, we're talking about reliefs for um, charity advertising, for example, um, should be zero rated for you. Um, that is now quite broad and, and very, very valuable. But if you also look at the release of buildings, uh, particularly where it's going to ask you to certify use as a relevant charity bill use or, or relevant residential use, um, great care needs to be, be, be you know, um, around those. If you change um, the use of that building within 10 years, there is a clawback. Um, and forgetting to do it, it can be very, very painful because you get the clawback as a penalty and you get no VAT recovery at all. I guess the other thing that I would say on VAT savings on costs um, is, is the core business, non-business uh, apportionments and core partial exemption apportionments. Um, naturally, it's, it, it's always worth refreshing that. I would say that, uh, that, that a charity, because of the complexities involved and the changes involved in the environment, all charities really should be looking at those um, agreements with the revenue and making sure that they are up to date and they should be reviewed, I would say, either annually or biannually um, to make sure that they're still fit for purpose. If you've got old agreements, they can still be, be valuable to you. Uh, but don't forget, um, in most agreements, there is a statement that says if you have a significant change, um, then the revenue can withdraw the uh, use of that agreement retrospectively. So great care. Um, Finally, um, gift aid, um, again on direct tax, um, make sure that uh, you claim your gift aid where you can. Um, there are some terrific tools uh, around BDO actually support a lot of clients on that. Um, so do, do have a look at that and make sure that you are maximizing um, those, those things. And I think actually I've run out of time. So we're gonna have some questions. Um, I'm gonna ask Ross to um, run the panel and I'll stop talking. Perfect. Thank you to both speakers, Glenn and Gavin. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so I've been monitoring the Q&A. Uh, we've had one question through on benchmarking, which I can take. Um, so the question was, where is the best source of benchmarking data? We, um, in our approach, tend to use a variety of places. The first is APQC, um, to give that a Google if you haven't used it before. Uh, the second is the FAME database, which is basically everyone's uh, published financial statements. And then there's a whole load of great um, think tank published data that is usually available on a sector by sector basis um, that we typically use as well. In the absence of any other questions, um, just monitoring the chat. I think what I'll do, given that we're at 9.45, is probably start to wrap it up there. But our contact details um, are on the top half of that screen. So please do uh, ping us an email um, if there's any specific questions on anything that was discussed today. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, it's been a delight to present to you. And if I could just finally close by saying that the last of our Every Penny Counts webinar series is on managing your cash on the 6th of September. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you very much and have a great day.